You are about to hear Dr. T.L. Osborne of Tulsa, Oklahoma, USA. T.L. has already shared the gospel to millions of people in more than 80 nations of the world. He has seen miraculous signs and wonders again and again as he teaches the truth of Jesus Christ. Now in this recording, you will experience the anointing of Dr. Osborne's powerful ministry firsthand as he shares this dynamic message. Thorn in the flesh. And before we get uh, uh, into this study, I want to read to you what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. Lest I should be exalted above, above measure uh, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Well, I'm sure that uh, most every Christian has heard that scripture read many times. One of the most prevalent objections raised today against the ministry of healing is Paul's thorn in the flesh. One traditional idea has led to another. The widespread teaching that God is the author of disease and that he desires some of the, his most devout children to remain sick and to glorify him by exhibiting fortitude and patience. That idea has no doubt led to the led to the teaching that Paul had a sickness and that God refused to heal him. We do not believe that anyone who will take the time to read all that God's Word says on the subject of healing could ever form such a conclusion. It's with a sincere desire to help every honest person that we present this study on Paul's thorn. Thousands of people have needlessly suffered for years believing that they were pleasing God who supposedly required Paul to suffer some kind of sickness. Now, in order to have a better understanding of this matter, let us consider what the Bible says about this thorn in the flesh. There's three questions that we deal with. Number one, what was Paul's thorn? Number two, what was its purpose? And number three, why was it sent to Paul? It's a strange thing that all over the world, wherever we've journeyed, in campaigns, crusades of evangelism, we find Christians who uh, know all about Paul's thorn. They don't know about God's healing, but they know about Paul's thorn. Uh, I, I've often wondered how it is that the, the, the theologians have managed to spread that teaching so far and miss the uh, abundant teaching in the Bible on healing for the body. The idea everywhere is that Paul was sick, he had a thorn, he prayed, he asked God to heal him, God didn't heal him, but God told him that his grace was sufficient for him. Now, there's not a bit of that true. And that's what we're going to talk about. You ready? Uh, this is sort of uh, uh, abrupt, and uh, it, it, it... As long as you... Let me put it this way before we tackle this. As long as you have the idea that God... Uh, wanted Paul to be sick and that Paul carried this sickness and that uh, Paul prayed and couldn't get rid of it and God said, no, I don't want to take it away from you. I want you to be patient and bear it. I'll give you grace. As long as we have that idea about Paul, then we're going to have, we're going to have that idea about other people. As long as there's an exception uh, maybe God doesn't want to heal this person. 
then uh, perfect faith cannot be exercised because faith is expecting God to do what he promised. Faith is expecting God's word to be confirmed. And uh, the gospel that we preach is the total healing, restoring life of Jesus Christ that comes to us, body, soul, and spirit. Now, so let's just analyze these carefully. What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? Was it sickness? The expression thorn in the flesh is used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament as an illustration. You might ought to mark that down. It's an illustration, always. In not one instance in the entire Bible is the figure thorn in the flesh ever used to mean sickness. Not once. Whenever the expression is used in the Bible, it specifically states what the thorn in the flesh is. Example, Numbers chapter 33, verse 55. The expression thorns in your sides illustrated the inhabitants of Canaan. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. Now that didn't mean sickness. Look at Joshua chapter 23, verse 13. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you. It's funny we don't go around preaching traps and snares. You can't get healed because you're caught in a trap. We don't do that said, there'll be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes, that time he says, until you perish from off the good land which the Lord your God hath given you. The Bible clearly states exactly what these thorns in the flesh were. Both times, the thorns were personalities. Paul states exactly what his thorn in the flesh was. He says, you ready? He says, it was a messenger of Satan. Or, as translated by others, it was the angel of the devil. Satan's angel, in other words. The illustration, thorn in the flesh, was a personality, the messenger of Satan. Now, God's word, uh, this word, messenger, is translated from the Greek word, angelos, which appears 188 times in the Bible. It's translated 181 times as angel and seven times as messenger. In all 188 times, without a solitary exception, it is referring to a person and never a thing. For example, Matthew 25, 41, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels or messengers. Paul's thorn in the flesh was one of those messengers of the devil. Paul said so. Preachers and teachers have labeled Paul's thorn in the flesh everything from an oriental eye disease to an unconverted wife. It seems so unreasonable to speculate about what the thorn in the flesh was when Paul says exactly what it was, a messenger of Satan. So, question number one, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? Answer, a messenger of Satan. Question number two, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh sent to accomplish? Paul not only tells us what his thorn was, a messenger of Satan, but he tells us 
what this messenger or angel of Satan came to do. He said, it was sent to buffet me. Now that's what Paul said. That's his words. We don't have to put, a, we don't have to put other words in his lips. He said, it was sent to buffet me. Okay? What does that word mean? Well, it means to deal blow after blow like waves beat on a ship or like uh, Matthew 26, 67 when it says that uh, they buffeted Christ. The word used in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 Paul said this messenger sent to buffet me. It must harmonize with the same meaning in these other passages. And in no case does buffet refer to sickness or disease. This messenger or angel of Satan was sent to buffet Paul continually. To deal blow after blow to this faithful man of God. To use the word buffet. This word buffet in 1 Corinthians 4.11 is translated in the Spanish Bible, beaten with many blows. A sickness can't beat you with many blows, but the harassing work of an angel of the devil certainly fits this description. The following description of Paul's sufferings will explain how this angel of Satan harassed Paul's life. We don't need to add sickness to this list. Neither Paul nor the scriptures mention sickness in this connection. You ready for this list? After Paul's conversion, God sent Ananias to him with the information in Acts 9, 16. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, Paul's sufferings came to pass in at least 15 different ways. You want to make this list? Number one, Acts 9, 26. The Jews took counsel to kill him right after his conversion. Number two, Acts 9, 26 to 29. He was hindered in joining the Christians. Number three, Acts 13, verses 6 to 12. He was opposed by Satan. Number four, <clears throat> Acts 13, verses 44 to 49. He was opposed by the Jews in a mob. Acts 13, verse 14, and verse 50 and 52. <clears throat> he was expelled out of Antioch and Pisidia. Number six, Acts 14, verses 1 to 5. He was mobbed and expelled from Iconium. Number seven, Acts 14, verses 6 to 19. He fled to Lystra and Derbe, where he was stoned and left for dead. That devil never left him alone. Number eight, Acts 19, verse eight. He was disputing continually with false brethren. Number nine, Acts 16, verses 12 to 40. He was beaten and jailed in Philippi. Number 10, Acts 17, verses one to 10. He was mobbed and expelled from Thessal Thessalonica. Thessalonica. <laughs> I've been talking French and Spanish until I can't say it in English. Number 11, Acts 17, verses 10 to 14. He was mobbed and expelled from Berea. Number 12, Acts 18, verses 1 to 23. He was mobbed at Corinth. That demon never left him alone. That messenger of Satan buffeted him, buffeting him. Blow after blow after blow. Number 13, Acts 19, verses 23 to 31. He was mobbed at Ephesus. Number 14, Acts chapter 20, verse 3. There was a plot against his life by the Jews. Number 15, he was seized by the Jews, mobbed, tried in court five times, and suffered other hardships. In a listen to this list, reproaches, necessities, from chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses. Then listen to this list from the 6th chapter of 2 Corinthians, stripes, 
imprisonments. He's never mentioned sickness yet. Hasn't he said enough? Isn't this enough to be a thorn in the flesh? Do we need to add sickness? Imprisonments, tumults, dishonor, evil report, deceivers, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. Then in the 11th chapter, he mentions stripes above measure. See how this devil keeps dogging his tracks? In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. And then he continues in 1 Corinthians. Uh, listen to this. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Listen to how this devil plagued him. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day in the deep, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen. That demon would never let him alone, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city. Paul's thorn in the flesh. And someone said it was sickness. He hasn't mentioned it yet. In perils in the wilderness. I'll deal with the scriptures in a few minutes that people use to prove that his thorn was sickness. But notice all this. This is the foundation. What did the thorn in the flesh do? What did the messenger do? I'm still reading. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness. In hunger and thirst. In cold and nakedness. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Being reviled, persecuted, defamed. <laughs> that devil never quit. As the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things unto this day. Who but Satan's angel could be responsible for all of these sufferings and buffetings? In enumerating them, we see that Paul mentions almost Everything one could think of except sickness or an eye disease. The one thing which Paul does not mention, theology seizes upon and says, that was his thorn. The only thing he didn't mention. <laughs> Why do preachers and teachers substitute sore eyes or sicknesses, which Paul does not mention, for all of this list, these lists of buffetings, which Paul does mention, certainly Paul's thorn could not have been defective eyesight because in Acts chapter 9, verse 18, Paul's eyes were healed. Now, I notice that the same people who preached that Paul was sick and he had a thorn in the flesh and... Uh, uh, we shouldn't pray for people because maybe God's using a thorn in the flesh. Uh, <laughs> I notice that those are people who, if someone gets healed, wants him to be healed 100%. They say, God don't just partly heal somebody. They say he heals him 100%. Well, Paul's thorn in the flesh couldn't have been bad eyesight because Acts 9, 18, he was healed. And Ananias prayed for him, and immediately there fell from his eyes scales, and he received his sight forthwith. I believe God healed him good. I'm sure he did. In answering these first two questions, we've based our remarks upon what Paul actually said himself. What was the thorn? What did it come to do to him? Too often, in, his, in discussing Paul's thorn in the flesh, preachers and teachers give their idea or what they think or what seems to be or what somebody says. They comfort the sick with this message. They say, Paul was sick and prayed three times to be healed, but God didn't see fit to heal him. God told Paul that his grace would be sufficient for him. Therefore, you must do like Paul did. Bear your thorn in the flesh, your thorn of sickness, and be faithful, and be patient, and wait for God's glory. We shouldn't tell people that. 
That isn't what God said to Paul. That isn't what happened to Paul. We shouldn't say what seems to be or what idea we might have or what it might be or what uh, some think it is. Paul said exactly what it was and what it came to do. So there's no argument about it. It was the messenger of Satan. There's a funny thing about that. I, I, can't, I can't help but throw it in. Think about this. People who preach against healing and people who pre a preacher, people who don't like for a preacher to preach about healing. And they preach that Paul's thorn in the flesh was sickness. I've noticed that they're usually the kind of people that react very strong when you preach that sickness is of the devil. You ever notice that? They're really against that doctrine. Sickness of the devil. No, sickness comes from God, they'll say. Sickness is a love token from God in disguise. Sickness will teach you patience. Sickness has come, comes from God in, in, in many forms to teach you. It's a love gift from God. A lot of lovely, rosy things they say about sickness. The Bible, of course, teaches that sickness is of the devil. The people who don't like us to teach that way are the very same people who usually teach that Paul had sickness. And isn't that strange because Paul said his thorn was a messenger of Satan. So if Paul was sick, his sickness was of the devil. If Paul was sick, it was a messenger of Satan. It was of the devil. Sickness today of the devil. But Paul wasn't sick. Let's go on. The Bible says nothing about Paul being sick. About him praying to be healed. Or about God requiring him to remain sick. Nothing. Instead of these things which the Bible does not say, this is what the Bible does say. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, not a disease, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Paul does not say, I prayed three times to be healed. Three times he went to the Lord and said, Lord, I am tired of this devil dogging my tracks. Every place I go, every place I show up to preach, that devil is there. Three times Paul got, went to the Lord and said, Lord, I am tired of it. Do something about it. The Lord said to him, Paul, hang in there. I know you're being persecuted and having a lot of troubles, but hang in there. My grace is sufficient for you, and I'm getting some points across, and you're giving the gospel, and people are realizing the value of the gospel. And if they have to suffer for the gospel, they're realizing what it means. Hang in there. I'll give you grace to bear it. I'm, I'm not going to make that devil leave you alone. Uh, he's, 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 he's hounding your, your tracks, but hang in there. That's what actually happened. God said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. God doesn't say, no, Paul, I want you to stay sick. Now, third question. Why was Paul's thorn sent to buffet him? Why? Well, this answer is just as easy as the first two answers. We don't have to, we don't have to suppose. We don't have to guess. Paul has said exactly why. It's remarkable how clear the Bible is when we just take it at face value. Why was this thorn sent to buffet him? Paul says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations that I have received. It's because of the abundance of revelation that Paul received. Paul, the man that wrote the big part of the epistles of the New Testament, the abundant revelations of the covenant, the new covenant of God's grace. Paul says, because I received those abundant revelations, I received this thorn in the flesh. Well, that would exclude you probably, wouldn't it? You wouldn't need to have a thorn in the flesh, would you? 
if you've got a thorn in the flesh, or if someone you go to minister to has a thorn in the flesh, uh, uh, it'd be good to check up and see about their abundant revelations. <laughs> I believe that eliminates most everybody. Uh, Paul glorified God and bore patiently the persecution and the problems that Satan poured upon his life and grew in the grace of God and was strong enough to take it and kept on preaching. Now, let's look at some ideas here. Uh, some, some scriptures that people use thinking to prove that Paul's thorn in the flesh was sickness. Let's take 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Infirmities. Do you hear that? Reproaches in necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. Galatians 4.13. You know how that through infirmity of the flesh, I preach the gospel. Now here's another one. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 3. I was with you in weakness. 2 Corinthians 10, 10. His bodily presence is weak. See, all this is supposed to prove Paul was sick. This word infirmity is translated from the same Greek word that Paul used in Romans 8, 26 when he wrote, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Does that mean helps our sicknesses? No. Our infirmities, for we know not what we for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. It's also the same word used in Hebrews eleven thirty four, which says that the prophets out of weakness were made strong. Does that mean out of sicknesses? were made strong? No. Weakness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, it's used to express the manner in which Christ was crucified. Listen to this. For though he was crucified through weakness, that's that same word, same one that Paul used, yet he liveth by the power of God. Did you get that? Though he was crucified through weakness, Yet he liveth by the power of God. Well, the word weak or weakness in these scriptures is the same word used in 2 Corinthians 12, 10 when Paul said, when I am weak, then am I strong. If the word weak meant he was sick, then the word strong would mean he was well. Didn't mean that at all. These words translated infirmities and weaknesses with reference to Paul's life were never intended to mean sickness or some eye disease. Notice the use of the word infirmity and weak, translated from the same Greek root words as those above. Notice them in the following scriptures. Substitute the word sickness or disease in their places, and you'll see that the idea is wrong. Take, for example, Romans 4.19. And being not weak in faith, so we would read, and being not sick in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. Abraham, being not sick in faith, same word, weakness, didn't mean sickness at all. Romans 8 and 3, for what the law could not do in that it was sick through the flesh. See, it doesn't mean that, in that it was weak through the flesh. That's the same word that Paul used when he talked about being weak. The weakness of human nature not sickness 
or disease. Look at Romans 4, 2. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is sick eateth herbs. No, another who is weak eateth herbs. Look at Romans 14, 21. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made sick. No, is made weak. This give you a light on that word? 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are sick. No, to them that are weak. 1 Corinthians 9, 22. To the sick became I as sick that I might gain the sick. That couldn't be possible. To the weak became I weak that I might gain them that are weak. I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Not sickness. The same word Paul used describing his case. 1 Corinthians 15, 43. You want another one? It is sown. Your life is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in sickness. No, in weakness. It is raised in honor, in power. 2 Corinthians 13, 3. For though he was crucified through sickness, Christ cru crucified through sickness, no, through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are sick in him. No. No, we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Hebrews 5, 2, you want another one? Who can, have com who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with sickness? No, infirmity. And many other verses the same throughout the Bible. So, what, what, what I want you, to help you understand is that Paul here is taught, when Paul speaks of weakness before his church, he's expressing his nothingness in his own strength and his utter dependence upon the Holy Spirit and the power of God. That your faith should stand not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Well, what about this word temptation? Galatians 4.14. My temptation, which was in my flesh, you despised not. Now that's supposed to mean my sickness, which was in my flesh, you despise. Now it doesn't mean that. My temptation, what does that mean? It goes on, you despise not my temptation, nor rejected, but received me as uh, an angel of God, even Jesus Christ. What was that temptation? Could that mean sickness? No. This word temptation, which people interpret to mean sickness, is translated from the same Greek word used to express Satan's challenge to Christ in the wilderness when the devil had ended all the temptation. Does that mean when the devil had ended all the sickness? No. It don't, it, it don't make sense. You have to weigh the scriptures. It was used by Jesus, the same word, when he said to pray that you enter not into temptation. Did Jesus say pray that you enter not into sickness? Was that his meaning? No. Temptation is altogether a different thing. Doesn't refer to sickness at all. My temptation, Paul said, that was in my flesh. No, his problems, his burdens, his aggravation, Satan plaguing him, dogging his tracks, day after day, never giving up, beating him, putting him in jail, cold, uh, 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 in perils of the deep, suffering all the time. And what about this other word? Paul's large letter. That's supposed to mean he was so near blind that when he wrote he had to use a great big letter for people to read. Galatians 6, 11, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. We're taught that Paul was so near blind he had to write using large letters. The word letter which Paul, which, uh, Paul wrote is translated from the same Greek word he used in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, when he said, The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Didn't mean a big letter of the alphabet or a big letter written in big handwriting that you have to write it big for it to kill. That's not the point. Didn't mean a letter of the alphabet. The word large, what about large, used 
in the English version to define Paul's letter. You see how large a letter. It's translated from the Greek word meaning a quantitative form. How much? Not how big. The word large is translated from the Greek as it's translated from the Greek is not the kind of large that's used to express size. No. Luke 22, 12 uses that same word when it speaks of a large upper room. The large in this scripture from Luke's gospel is translated from the Greek word megas, which simply means big. Paul's letter was quantitatively large. A letter of the alphabet can be large in size, but not in quantity. Paul undoubtedly speaks of, of his epistle, his letter, as being large in quantity, simply because it wasn't his custom to do his own writing. So he wrote quite a large letter. He wrote quite a long letter, wrote quite a big letter, uh, 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 qu quite a lot he wrote. Well, they say in, uh, they use this scripture, Galatians 4.15. I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. And that's supposed to mean that poor old Paul had ophthalmia, an oriental eye disease, and he was almost blind, and so they felt so sorry for him, they'd pluck out their eyes and give to him. The Galatians were simply ex expressing their affection for Paul, that's all. The close of one of our crusades overseas, I'll never forget, there was a, there was a, it had been an enormous crusade. There had been over a, a 90 blind people had been healed in that crusade, and the pastors were so grateful to us. And so we had the closing meeting, and I'll never forget, in one of the farewell speeches, one of the pastors, the pastor got up and he spoke so eloquently, and among other things, he said, Reverend Osborne, our people love you. They are thankful to God for your coming to us. They want you to know that they would cut off their right arm and give it to you if it were possible. Well, that didn't mean I had cancer of the right arm. <clears throat> Traditional speculation about Paul's thorn in the flesh is based upon scriptures who, which do not support these suppositions. If Paul was nearly blind with an eye disease, if he was weak and sickly in his body, if he prayed three times to receive healing but was refused because he received all these revelations and needed to keep humble, then these allegations would contradict so much of the Bible. Let's think a little bit. Are you willing to think a little bit? I believe in thinking. Number one, since healing is an essential element of the gospel, how could Paul enjoy the fullness of the blessing of the gospel and be sick? Romans 15, 29 said he enjoyed the fullness of the blessing of the gospel. Healing is a part of the gospel. How could he enjoy its fullness and be sick? Second point, if Paul was sick, how could the people to whom he preached receive faith for such special miracles that the Bible talks about in Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12? When he preached, folks received special miracles. Strange if he was sick. Third point. If Paul was sick, how could it be that the first sermon he preached at Lystra, a crippled man there, crippled from his birth, received so much faith from Paul preaching the gospel that he had faith to be healed. And Paul perceived it and said, get up and walk. First place, if he was almost blind, I don't know how Paul would have seen him if he wasn't on the front row. <laughs> but how did he receive enough faith to be healed, a cripple from birth, if Paul was standing up there sick? Fourth point. If Paul was sick or diseased, how could Romans 15, verses 18 and 19 be true? 
He made the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit. Usually, preachers who are incapacitated by sickness or disease don't usually make a lot of people uh, obedient by signs and wonders, do they? Let's take another point. If Paul was sick and diseased, as they tell us, how is it that when he was preaching on the pagan island of Melita, that the father of Publius's, of Publius was healed, and Paul prayed for him, and he got healed, and then all the other people on the island who had diseases brought them and were healed. Wouldn't that be strange for someone who was sick himself? Doesn't make sense. Six point. Since Paul's thorn didn't hinder the faith of the people to be healed of physical diseases in Ephesus, Melita, Lystra, why should it be used to hinder the faith, to hinder the faith of people needing healing today? It didn't hinder them then. Why should we say Paul was sick and hinder people from getting healed today? Eighth point. Paul's thorn in the flesh never incapacitated him in the ministry because he could say in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 15 verse 10, I labored more abundantly than they all. How could a sick man do that? Could a sick man labor more abundantly than everybody else? Doesn't seem like it. Usually the preacher who's incapacitated by sickness doesn't labor more than everybody else. Paul practiced what he preached. He said in 2 Timothy 2.21, be prepared to ever good work. He labored more abundantly than all of them. He said in 2 Timothy 3.17, be thoroughly furnished to all good works. He said in Titus 2.14, be zealous of good works. He said in Titus 3.8, be careful to maintain good works. He said in Hebrews 13.21, be perfect in ever good work. And he said in 2 Corinthians 9.8, and abound in every good work. A sick man can't do these things, can he? If the statement, my grace is sufficient for thee, this is the ninth point, if that meant that God was telling Paul to keep his sickness, that he would give him grace to bear it, it'd be the only case in the Bible where God gave grace to a physical body. He gives grace to our spirit, not to our bodies. He gives his life to our bodies, health to our bodies, grace to our spirits. <laughs> Well, that's just an idea. Uh, tenth point. Paul's thorn didn't keep him from finishing his course. Eleventh point. Paul's ministry continually abounded in miracles and healings. It's funny that people who believe they've got a thorn in the flesh, they don't abound in miracles and healings. Twelfth point. Paul's preaching continually produced faith for healing in, an, in his audience. People who are sick don't do that. Thirteenth point. Paul said in Acts 20 and 20, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. He believed in healing. He was well. He didn't keep back anything. If you keep back healing, you keep back part of the gospel. Fourteenth point. Paul said in Romans 15, he, he said to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through the mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, I fully preached the gospel. I believe he preached healing too. I believe he was a healed man. He was well and strong. His thorn in the flesh was that devil that hounded him day after day after day. But God said, Paul, you've received all these revelations. Uh, you're a great man. I love you. But uh, uh, I, I'm going to give you grace to bear this. Hang in there. Keep on preaching. I hope today that you will purpose. When I go out to preach on healing, I won't take Paul's thorn as my text, but I'll take the promises of God, the substitution of Jesus Christ, the covenant of God, the gospels of Jesus Christ, the great commission of Jesus Christ, the ministry of the early church, the ordinance of the early church to pray for the sick, 
and I'll tell about all of the miracles that God's done down through the ages. And I'll lift people and encourage them to know what God did for others, he'll do for you. That's the way to build faith. God bless you. I love you. I hope this has helped you. And I'll see you next week with another great lesson.